All right, guys, I want to go ahead and get your chapter four lecture posted. Um, so those of you who are <clears throat> staying up or even working a day or so ahead, y'all can get started. To recap a couple of things, first of all, I think I may have one or two of you who still have not gotten access to the book. So I posted the guide <clears throat> and also some guidance from another teacher on an announcement to try to guide you in. Secondly, one of the students uh, in our, I put it on a discussion board. One of the students said how they got there. Another one came back and said, well, I couldn't get there the way she got there. This is how I got there. I'm gonna ask you to try all those first. <clears throat> if you still do not have access to the book, then what I'll probably have to do is find somebody maybe in the library system that can help you get that access. I can't see what you see. With mine, it, it, the Pearson link is just the link now that is on the left-hand side where you have, well, mine may be different again, but you have the modules and the syllabus and down there, there should be a Pearson one and there is where I go in to get to the book. So if you still are not getting it, make sure you email me, um, message me some kind of way and get to me that you have not gotten to the book so that we can get you in there. Um, the videos assignment, I got a couple of you haven't turned it in as of yet. It's due tonight. Um, I really hope that out of that assignment, you came to see that while we're going to study the structure of the systems, you know, we're going to look at police departments. We're going to look at um, what they can and can't do, how they're structured, what their history is, how we developed police and all. But we're not, and, and we're going to do court, same thing with court, same thing with jails. But I don't ever want you to forget that it's people, it's real life people that are caught in this system, whether that be as the defendant, whether that be as a victim, whether that be as someone in the court system who has to make the decisions, might be attorneys who are having to either come in and try to prove they committed the crime or defend them from that, that um, prosecution. All of these people are people. And so don't ever forget that, that there are personal impacts. Um, having looked at the introductory paragraphs, I know a lot of you are with the sheriff's office and some of you have been there quite a while. I doubt any of this is new stuff. And I know full well that you, among all others, you see so many of the same people over and over or so many of the same issues over and over. And it probably becomes difficult sometimes to um, really maintain that level of caring and concern. So I'll encourage you to do that. We see the same thing at the courthouse. It seems like it's the same people that are, you know, showing up at our door. Um, it's the same issues over and over. So we deal with it too over at the courthouse, but that doesn't mean that we benefit by stereotyping or by giving up anything like that. So I'm just going to encourage you keep fighting the fight as best you can. But from those stories, I hope you see it, the, the, the idea of it was to make you focus in on one particular person and how the criminal justice system impacted that person and that the view is really different from all of those different positions. Okay, you have a test this week. It'll be on chapters one, two, and four. One and two we went over last week, four we're gonna go over today. Um, it will be two hours long. Once you start it, you got to finish it. So make sure you have set aside enough time when you sit down to start to take the test to finish it. It'll be the same as your review questions, you know, fill in the blank, true, false, multiple choice. There won't be any essay on it. Um, I'm going to encourage you to really check your spelling or fill in the blank. You may, some of you may have noticed your points go up one or two points on the review questions. That's because you spelled the word wrong. And I have to go back in manually and adjust that. So everything, every test, quiz, whatever you turn in, I'm going, I'm looking at it question to question to make sure. Sometimes they put, you know, we an S is on it and the answer that's logged into the computer and you didn't put an S on it. Um, but the word arraignment, for some re reason, just blows people's minds. And some of y'all weren't even close to that spelling. So I went back and gave you those points. 
Um, I'm going to have a little something for you when we finish the lecture today that I think will help prepare you. A lot of you are tied in with this program they have now, I know with the Sheriff's Office and RPCC, and many of you told me that you have concerns. It's been so long since you were in school that you're balancing so many things. Even some of my younger students, um, some of you already have several kids, you're working full time. I get all that. And a lot of you are returning to school. So you've taken a break for one reason or another, and now you're back in school and you voiced concerns to me that you'll be able to keep up, that you'll be able to catch on again. So for that reason, I'm going to give you a little bit of help on this first test to kind of get you prepared. Um, and so we're going to finish chapter or do chapter four today. So finish up everything that will be on the test. After this week, you take your test. Um, the other, I think, assignment that's due is your other writing assignment is to write about a killer. Now, we studied the different killers, the mass, the spree, the serial. Um, I have a list of those. You can find one on your own. This week's assignment is only to turn in the name of the killer you're going to write about. I do not want the paper yet. Just the name of the killer. Ten points. Can't miss those ten points. But do take some time. Don't just pick a name because it may not be somebody that you really want to write about come next week or the week after when you do have to turn the paper in. So take some time after you finish your tests and just kind of look through some of these killers. I mean, you can Google their names and kind of see what their story is. Um, and so that's the other thing that'll be due this week is the name of the killer for your killer paper. After this week, you're already 25% finished with class. So eight weeks this is going to go really fast. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really the one setting the schedule, if you know what I mean. I've got material that I have to cover. So I have to cover it in really the seven weeks because the eighth week is pretty much just the final. All right. That being said, let's get going on chapter four. Let me see if I can tie in my PowerPoint for you. Okay. We're going to start chapter four by talking out, talking about why do we even need laws? I mean, we're talking about criminal justice and it all has to do with the statutes and the laws. Last week, we looked at all these different definitions of crimes, um, reading those definitions. Why do we need law? Well, there's a lot of reasons why we need it. We've, we've got to maintain order in society. If you think about it, if we had no laws, if we had no criminal laws, then it would really be... Uh, it would be just out in the wild. Those who are most powerful would take what they wanted. Um, I would assume gangs would probably be, be, be um, formed because that would make you even more powerful. So we, we definitely need laws to maintain order. It also helps us regulate hu human interaction. So we, in essence, are told how we are supposed to treat other people. We're not supposed to be physically abusing them. Um, we're not supposed to be stealing their stuff. So it does tell us how to behave with each other. It enforces moral beliefs. You know, there's people who have um, beliefs. I hope you're one of them that, for instance, children shouldn't, shouldn't be subject to certain things, especially sexual acts and all. Those are beliefs that, look, it's just not right. That's just not what we do in society. Also, it enhances predictability. Think about the next time you approach a stoplight. If we didn't have laws, there would be no stoplights that said you had to stop on red. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel a lot more comfortable going through that green light if I assume that the other side that's got red is going to stop. So it's it, it enhances the predictability that they're going to stop and I'm going to be okay by going through. It sustains my individual rights. I have the right to have property, own property, go places, do things. If there were no laws, I, I wouldn't have any of those rights. Nothing would be on the books to say you're allowed to do it. It also allows us to identify wrongdoers. So if we know what things are that are wrong, then we know who's doing those things. So it's easier to pinpoint the, you know, the so-called bad people in society. And we also, man, it also helps puts in the punishment system. So it mandates punishment, retribution. That's how if somebody steals something, they should be ordered to return it to you or pay you for it. That's retribution. It's making the person whole again. So there's all kinds of reasons why we need laws. Now, the rule of law, and this is really interesting. 
the rule of law is basically that all people must live under the law for this orderly society to work, okay? And what it means is everybody's subject to the law. Nobody's above the law. And if you are following any of the Trump um, legal stuff that's going on now, you will hear rule of law discussed quite often because the question is, is a president of the United States above the law? Well, our country believes the rule of law, which says, no, our laws, our codes should be applied uniformly and fairly to everyone from the richest to the poorest, from the highest elected in the office to the lowest of the low. So that's the rule of law. Nobody is above the law. So there's different types of law, right? And here we're gonna talk about criminal law. Criminal law can be broken down into two basic branches, statutory law and case law. The statutory law is what we looked at last week. The statutes, right? Murder, the killing of another human being. That's a statute. I can look that up in the law. It has a code number um, and, and it's in the criminal code. Those statutes sometimes address substance, the substance of the law, like those definitions we looked at. Sometimes it's procedural. Listen, this is how a jury, this is how it's going to go. You're going to be um, brought to in front of a judge within 72 hours if you're still in jail to be appointed a lawyer. You're going to have the right to uh, file for a bond hearing. That's procedure of how you get through the system. So criminal law is made up of the two branches, statutory and case law. But statutory law, that's your codes, that's the statutes. Some of those statutes are substantive, some of them are procedural. So the other side of this, besides the statutes, is case law. And that means cases that have happened before that courts have ruled on and written decisions about. And the, the term that's used when we rely on case law is stare decisis. And really, to me, the way you remember that is decision, right? It's a previous decision, stare decisis. And what that means is if this exact same issue has already gone up to an appeals court, to a Supreme Court, and they have ruled on it, then we should be following what they ruled. Because presumably, they would do the same ruling again if it got up to them again, right? So it's relying on the case law above. That's why when we have an issue come up in court, a legal question to determine, well, wait, what's the answer to this? Is it this or this? We go and try to find an earlier case which already answered that question. Okay, so we had criminal law. There's also civil law. Civil law is not criminal, really. That's kind of how you think about it. With civil law, it's going to regulate um, relationships between people, business, government. This is civil suits. You don't go to jail when you're in civil court. Interestingly enough, look at what I do. It's almost quasi because if you file for a civil protective order, it's we're in civil court. However, if you violate that civil protective order, it's a criminal offense. So some things kind of hop from one to the other. If you come into my child support court, we're in civil court. You're being ordered to pay child support. However, if you don't pay your child support, you can go to jail. So it ends up, again, kind of jumping from one to the other. Most people think about civil law as, you know, that's your attorney's, you know, have you got your check yet? Injured in an accident? Call me. Okay, those are civil suits. Those are people that have been wronged by somebody else, the majority of them being car accidents. They've been hurt, they have damages, and they're entitled to money. Most of the time in civil suits, money is the solution, but going to jail is not the solution. We have an area called administrative law, and that's really the things that um, rule certain types of business. Most often we see it like tax laws, Tax laws are pretty interesting, too, because, again, tax law and what you have to file and how you file, that's civil law. But if you violate the taxes, I mean, if you do something wrong on your taxes, commit fraud or whatever, you could go to jail for it. So sometimes things do cross over. But administrative law is basically regulations um, in business, industry, government. 
And uh, common law. Now, common law is what's been the normal usage and custom. It's not in a statute. It's not um, necessarily in a case that you go pull up. It's just what's usual and customary. I'll tell you, in my legal career, the most often that we heard the term common law is I'd have somebody come in and say, well, I need a divorce. Okay, well, when were you married? Well, we didn't really get married. We've just lived together as man and wife for the last 20 years. She's my common law wife. Louisiana doesn't follow common law. We don't rely on usage and custom, but that's pretty much what it means. If you go, I think Mississippi, if they did years ago, I haven't looked at it recently, but they followed common law marriages, where if you held yourself out basically as man and wife and lived like man and wife and managed all your finances like man and wife, you were common law spouses. We don't have that here. Okay, so let's go back and look at criminal law a little bit more um, specifically. Criminal law is the rules and regulations that define and specify the nature of and punishments for offenses. So um, we just looked at some of them last week. We talked about, you know, what's the definition of robbery? What's the definition of theft? Um, I did, I'm doing this from home again and my criminal code is at work, but if I had my criminal code to show you, when you read through one of the code articles, it'll tell you what the definition is and then it will go into the punishment. For anybody convicted on a first offense, they shall receive this to this. So each code article, that's the rules and regulations, say not only what the offense is, but also what's the punishment for it. And again, criminal law talks about um, violations result in punishment upon conviction. So you are convicted of a crime in criminal law. It's built on constitutional principles and it operates within a set of procedures. And we know that it includes now statutory, remember that's our codes and our written law and case law. So that's criminal law. Civil law, and I'm kind of going back, I, I didn't realize they had separate um, slides for these. That again is the relationships between and among usually people, businesses, organizations, governmental agencies. Most of the time you're talking about a civil suit that seeks money is how civil law is enforced. And it's not a crime. You're not gonna go to jail because you get sued for an accident. Now that same accident, you may have committed a crime you know, maybe it was vehicular homicide. So you can end up in both courts because you may be charged with the crime of killing the person, but you also may be sued by them or their family members um, in civil law. Administrative law, we just talked about, usually industries, businesses. Um, and again, some of it may overlap. Most of it in administrative law, it's not crimes, but like tax law but there are some tax fraud criminal laws that do kind of overlap into those administrative regulations. Health codes, pollution laws, you know, pollution laws tell the plants and all what they can and can't do, but you can be end up in jail if um, it crosses over into the criminal realm of things. Statutory law, we just talked about, that's the written codified law. Um, we went over them last week where there's a written definition. Case law, law of precedent, cases that have come from judicial decisions above or before this case, stare decisis, and common law. That's just used in usage and custom, like the man who said I need a divorce, but he was never really married. Okay, so let's talk about the categories of crimes. Felonies are the most serious crimes. Felonies are punishable by death or imprisonment at hard labor. Um, for us, a lot of people you'll hear in Louisiana say if it's six, if the punishment is six months or more, you're talking about a felony. If it's less than that, it's a misdemeanor. Um, we're going to go with, I think it's easier for you to remember the definition that is in the book, and that is punishable by death or imprisonment and hard labor. That's a felony. Misdemeanor is anything else. So if it's not a felony, it's a misdemeanor. It's not punishable by death or imprisonment at hard labor. And imprisonment at hard labor is different from a simple jail sentence. Imprisonment at hard labor is gonna send you up to the Department of Corrections facilities.
Okay, sorry about that. Got interrupted real quick. Let me go back to our PowerPoint. And actually, I want to go back. Sorry about this. I have a um eighty. I'm sorry. I have a ninety six year old mother who just called me to help change the channel on the TV. So I apologize. Um, I don't want to share it yet. I'm going to get out of this. That. I'm on one thing ahead. I'm trying to make sure I go back. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry about that. Okay, so anyway, so we've got the felonies. We know they're punishable by death or imprisonment and hard labor. We've got misdemeanors. That's other than felonies. Offenses or infractions. That's your little stuff that you just kind of get tickets for, littering, traffic tickets, um, much, much more minor. You're not, you're not going to be put in jail for that. Now, we'll get to some of the biggies. Treason, that's if you're helping a foreign government to overthrow or injure the United States. Um, fortunately, we don't see that very often. <laughs> Espionage, that's gathering, transmitting, or losing national defense info to enemies. So that's related to treason, but this is transmitting the national defense information. And in coate, that means it hasn't been completed. So those are your attempted crimes. Um, you didn't finish the job but uh, you attempted to commit the crime. So that's inchoate is that word. So there are several general features of a crime. And what I kind of call the big three um, are actus reus, mens rea, and concurrence, okay? Is the big three elements of any crime. Actus reus, this is the actual guilty act. So that individual must commit a voluntary act. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be doing something. It could be not doing something, okay? There are crimes of commission, which means you did something to commit the crime. And there are crimes of omission, meaning you didn't do something. Um, and, and that was a crime. I have really... Uh, interesting protective order that's been pending in my court. The parties are dealing in other courts and all where the woman wants a protective order against her. I don't know if they're ex-spouses yet or soon to be ex-spouses for sure, uh, because she was very sick and was in a hospital room and her husband, this is her story now, her husband was with her and she had stroke or a heart attack. She had some life-threatening event. And the husband, she says, did nothing. And to make matters worse, he he's an EMT. He is like an ambulance, you know, person. So he knows emergency medicine. And she says he stood there and did nothing. So kind of an interesting take on, you know, the allegation is that he, he his crime, and I, I do think she's trying to pursue criminal charges too. I'm not sure about that, but his crime would be one of omission. You did nothing. 
you did nothing and watched me. And she didn't die, but at the time thought she was going to die. So threatening to act can be a crime. Thinking alone is not enough to make it a crime. So just because it crosses your mind, I could knock the padubies out of somebody, that's not a crime. Threatening to do it, I'm coming over there to knock you silly. Remember, assault in Louisiana is that threat of the battery. If I come over there, I, oh, I could just knock you so hard. That's an assault. So threatening can be a crime. Thinking alone is not a crime. And more interesting, what if I had a speaker um, come to our class and that person stood up there and said, I use drugs. I use illegal drugs. Well, we have some police officers in our class. Can they arrest her or him at that point? No, because She's just said she does, but you haven't caught her doing it. You don't know if what she's saying is the truth, right? So let's remember the big three. Actus reus, act. That's how you're going to remember it. It's the act, doing or not doing something. Now we're going to go to mens rea, which is the mind. What's the mental state of the person when they committed the crime? Um Louisiana uses the terms specific criminal intent or general criminal intent. For our purposes and what's in the book and explained to you in the book, so we're going to stick with that for now, is there's four main types of mental states. Number one is the intentional, purposeful. You went and did it intending to do it. You, you said you were going to pull out the gun and shoot him and you did Knowing is more of an awareness. It is, um, it's knowing that um, your conduct is going to cause that type of uh, injury. Uh, and I'm, I'm just double checking the book because I want to make sure I'm saying what you're going to be reading exactly. So knowing behavior is undertaken with awareness. A person who acts purposefully always acts knowingly, but a person who acts in a knowing way may not have cr criminal intent. Um, so it's, it's not intentional. It's not a deliberate, I intend to do this, but it is knowing what the results are gonna be when you do it. Reckless is more or less a you should have known better. Reckless, it increases the risk of harm. You might not have intended the harm, but you should know that what you did would endanger others. And finally, negligent is the person should have known better that, uh, you know, that what they were doing was below the standard of care of a normal person. So when you have um, negligent homicide, that's a little different from intentional, homicide meaning murder. So if you're negligent murder, that means that, you know what, you were playing with the gun, you pointed it at them, you know, that's well below the standard of care of a reasonable person, but much different from you intended to kill the person, so you pulled the gun and shot them. All of this is in connection with mens rea, the guilty mind. And remember, these are the elements of the crime. You've got to have an act. You've got to have the guilty mind. And before we leave the guilty mind, a couple of more little things. Motive is not the same as mens rea. Motive is why you committed the crime. It's not what were you thinking as far as did you intend it? Were you just being um, negligent? Were you being reckless? Motive is why you did it. Strict liability crimes don't require that mental state, meaning we don't care what you were thinking. When I was stopped by that state trooper for speeding on airline highway the other day, he didn't get out and say, hey, what were you thinking? Did you intend to be going above the speed limit? It doesn't matter what you were thinking. It's a, did you cross the line? If you did, then you have committed the crime. Same thing with statutory rape, which we don't actually use that exact term here in Louisiana, but you know, for some, um, 
let's say teenagers, um, they're not of age to give consent to sex. So if you have sex with that teenager, even though in your mind it was consensual, if that person was under the age to give consent, you raped them, right? Because there is no consent. They can't do such a thing as consent. You raped them. And at that point, we don't really care what your thinking was. We don't care whether you knew this was wrong, didn't know, it doesn't matter. She said yes, he said, it doesn't matter. Just like the speeding, if you if you run in a red light, does he care what you were thinking? No, you ran the red light. So those are strict liability crimes. We're not gonna have to find that criminal intent that we talked about earlier. Now, what we have to have happen is those two things, the act and the guilty mind, the mental state, occur together. One can't come before the other. And when I say that, think the example that they give you in the book, which I think is pretty good. You decide you can no longer put up with you know, John Doe. So you have decided you're going to drive to his house and you've got your gun and you're going to go in his house and kill him. But as you get near his house in his neighborhood, he runs out in front of your car and you run over him and kill him. So does that go down as a you know premeditated murder? Did you have the intention at that moment to kill him? No, you didn't. Ironically, you did five more minutes down the road when you caught him at his house, but they have to happen together. So had you made it to his house and gone in his house and killed him, clearly you have that act and the guilty mind at the same time. But if you accidentally run over him around the block from his house, you didn't have the two at the same time. So that would not go at the same level. It still may be a crime depending on how you were driving, depending on your, you know, whether you're under any substance abuse or things like that, whether you're impaired, still may be a crime, but it's not going to be to the level of the premeditated murder, basically, which it would have been had you gone on in and shot him. So those are the big three, actus, mens rea, and the concurrence, they happen at the same time. There are some others though. And the first one that we'll talk about is causation. And causation means that your act actually caused the injury. So what if, well, let's take a real case because it just happened not that, well, the crime didn't happen that long ago, but I mean, it happened a long time ago. So in chapter one, when we talked about, um, there was a police shooting up on Airline Highway years ago after the Alton Sterling shooting, when all that was going down, a guy from Dallas came over and he, he shot some police officers in Baton Rouge. And one of those police officers did not die at the time. However, he was severely wounded and spent years um, never getting out of the hospital again, always in some sort of rehab hospital, always needing some treatment. He finally died, I think last year. Y'all may remember better than me. I lose track of time. Um, so did that shooting actually, was that a murder? Because he lived years later. So the example that I've put on here is your shooting victim who dies a year later due to a blood clot. Was that due to the criminal act? I don't know. I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just telling you sometimes causation, meaning what the criminal act and guilty mind did together caused the harm. It was the legal cause of the harm. Sometimes that's harder to prove than what you think. Um, what about, you know, you have to have a resulting harm. Well, hold up. There are some people that say, not all crimes have victims. What about prostitution? What's the resulting harm? What about illegal gambling? What's the resulting harm? Most people would tell you the resulting harm is the harm to society. There may not be a particular victim, but as a society, we are harmed when those illegal activities are going on. And then they have the interesting um, 
suggestion in the book. What about attempts? So you decide to throw some rocks at a blind person and you miss. Is there harm? I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I guess it depends on, you know, whether he knows you were throwing at him and he knows that he may have been in danger. But this is just to kind of get you thinking that, well, hold up, everything may not be quite as clear as what we think it is. The principle of legality, what this means is it's not a crime unless I can go to a statute and find a law that says this behavior is a crime. So in other words, there has to be a, a, a law in the books saying it's a crime for it to be a crime. Uh, principle of punishment. To be a crime, there has to be a punishment. So again, it kind of falls back almost on the one before. There's got to be something in the books that say this behavior is illegal and this is the punishment for committing that crime. Um, and sometimes there are necessary attendant circumstances. And the example that they give in the book on this, I believe, is sometimes crimes require additional elements. So if you are charged with committing a lewd act in the presence of a child under the age of 16, what's an additional element to that crime? Well, there has to have been a child there under the age of 16, right? The act is the lewd act, but it had to be in the presence of a child under the age of 16. So sometimes that's a feature of a crime. You can't have committed the crime you may have had done an act, the lewd act. You may have had the guilty mind. But if the crime itself requires the additional element of in the presence of a child under the age of 16, that's an additional element that has to be there. So there are necessary attendant circumstances as well. Um, elements of a crime are specific legal aspects of a criminal offense that must be proven to obtain a conviction. So. What that means is kind of what we talked about last week, and that is when you read one of these criminal codes and you read the definition. So let's take the example of murder and agree. I, I mean, again, first degree murder, in, this, is, this is what reads in other states, right? Because we talked about ours, our regular premeditated murder is actually second degree. But let's take first degree murder, what most people in the country think it is, which is what it is in other states. It's the unlawful killing of a human being intentionally with planning or malice of forethought. So there are your elements. If you are the prosecutor coming in to prove that somebody committed first degree murder in another state, you're gonna have to prove there was a killing. You're gonna have to prove it was a human being. You're gonna have to prove it happened intentionally. And you're gonna have to prove that there was some planning beforehand. That's where we get to the premeditated, right? The premeditated murder means you planned it ahead of time. And those become the elements of a specific criminal offense. Now, corpus delecti of a crime. If you're old like me, or if you have parents or grandparents, you may have them sometimes use that corpus delecti. That's the body, show me the body. Um, that's close. It's very close. Actually, corpus delecti means the body of the crime. So you have to show that a crime occurred for someone to be tried on the crime, right? That's where you hear, and again, if you watch all the whodunit shows and all like I do, that's why you'll often hear them say it's very difficult to win a murder conviction when you don't have a body makes it a lot easier when you have a body. Now, that doesn't mean, see how these kind of two kind of run into each other. We don't mean, when we say corpus delecti, we don't mean that person's body. We mean the body of the crime. But it so often comes up in, well, hold on, how are we going to prove that person was even murdered if we don't have his body or her body? So <clears throat> the key aspects, there was a result produced and the person is criminally responsible. But you can see if you have physical evidence there, it would be a lot easier to do that, to say that the result was produced and that person is responsible. But the corpus delecti means the body of the crime. 
Now, there are defenses to criminal charges, right? So everybody always comes up with one of these as either I didn't do it or this is why I did it. So we're going to look at each of these individually. This chart is on your book in your book. I don't know on the ebook if y'all have pages jive with mine because again I have the uh the printout. I'm looking at it on page 123 in the book. I don't know if, like I said, I don't know if that jobs, but it's in chapter four, this chart. And it really does show the basic four different categories, alibi, justification, excuse, and procedural defense. So let's look at alibi. Alibi, and again, if you watch any whodunits, you definitely know what this means. I could not have committed the crime because I was somewhere else. And in this situation, the defendant is truly innocent, right? He could not have committed the crime. And it's supported by witnesses and documentation. Now, what do we all know, those of us who watch our whodunits? Well, he could have gotten somebody else to do it. And then he made sure he was across town, you know, too far away kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I get that. But for the most part, you'll hear that police officer on my whodunit show saying, where were you last night? Where were you on the afternoon of so-and-so? Because they're trying to see, does the person have an alibi? Could he not have committed the offense because he was somewhere else? And in that case, he really didn't do the crime. Justifications are a little different. Justification means I did it, but I had a reason why I had to do it. So with those, you're looking at self-defense. He came at me first. It was him or me, and I had to kill him. I have put some videos on here that I strongly encourage you to watch. Though I'm not going to stop and do it on this tape because I've seen the videos. But it would be great if you go back in the PowerPoint and click on these and watch them, especially the stand your ground laws. The stand your ground laws are really interesting um, because you're supposed to have reasonable force and I think what you're going to see on that video is sometimes, um, you know, the question is, was it reasonable under the conditions there? I think this video right here is the one of the gentleman in Florida. And I really encourage you to watch that one and see if you're on the jury, you know, what would, what would you find? Um, you know, some of these come up with um, domestic, right? She killed him. Well, some of them she's going to say, oh, I did it in self-defense. He, he was beating me, so I had to kill him. Yeah, but hold up. He, you shot him in his sleep. He, he wasn't beating you. So what's happened with a lot of those cases in the case of an abused spouse, a lot of juries have gone just with that. Yes, if he was in the process of beating you or about to beat you, you were truly in danger at that moment. And yeah, you're going to, you're going to fall under one of these self-defense or stand your ground. However, if you planned it to happen at another time, you just had enough because he'd beaten you over the years and you decided that night was it. You were going to get the gun when he was sleeping and shoot him in the head. Most juries have not bought that as a justification. Defense of others is another justification, meaning uh, same kind of thing as self-defense. Instead of I had to do it to protect myself, I had to do it to present, I mean, to, to protect somebody else. Defense of home and property. You were coming in my home. Um, now here, what we have most of the time, the defenses will fly if um, that perpetrator is intending or is committed violent acts against the person then yes, it's to me, it falls under the self-defense at that point. But if they're, if, if they're not, if they have not come after the person at all, you're not supposed to use deadly force. So you, that's one of the questions on your test, by the way. You are allowed, true or false, you are allowed to use deadly force to protect your home. Mm, no, that's not under the letter of the law. You should not be using deadly force unless you are threatened with bodily harm. Consent is another justification. It wasn't rape. She consented to the sex. And they tell you the story of a, um, a rapist. I want to say it was in Texas, but you'll see it in the book. 
he was just starting to rape her and she said, please wear a condom. And he said, once she asked him to put on a condom, she consented to the sex. Uh, well, needless to say, the jury didn't buy it. So he was still convicted as a rapist. Necessity, that was another justification. Look, um, I think the sample in the book, again, is one that's pretty eating, pretty <laughs> eating, pretty interesting. Uh, we needed to do this to prevent greater harm. The example is the boat, the, the shipwreck and the sailors and the cabin boy are on the raft. They're all lost at sea and the sailors have to eat the cabin boy. And they say it was a necessity to stay alive. That was to give up his life, kept all the rest of us alive. Resisting unlawful arrest, which of course is pretty tough because you know, you've got to determine whether that unlawful arrest was really unlawful. Um, but those are all justifications. Now, did they do it or not do it under a justification? I did it, right? I did it, but I'm justified in doing it because of one of these reasons. How about excuses? I did it, but I have an excuse. Um, I was under duress. Look, I had to steal my boss's payroll. Um, these people contacted me. They had kidnapped my daughter. And they said, if I didn't get them that money, then they were going to kill my daughter. So I'm under duress. It's not It's not me acting of my right mind. I, I, I was under stress to do it. Age. Well, with an age, um, you know, we have a certain age. If you're under 10, you're not going to be charged with this, with the crime. Under the age of 10, by statute for us, means you're not chargeable with the crime. So that may be an excuse. It was a mistake. And again, you know, ignorance is not an excuse. However, the old lady growing the pot for her tea that she makes had no idea that growing pot was illegal or um, mistake of fact. I didn't know where the property line was. Yeah, I stepped over the property line, but I didn't know where it was. It was a mistake. Involuntary intoxication. Well, you know, involuntary means I didn't have a choice. They poured the alcohol down my throat. I couldn't discern right and wrong, and that's why it happened. Or even unconsciousness. I was at a point of unconsciousness, and I could not. Um, I, I, there's no way that I could have known what I was doing. You'll also see diminished capacity, um, mental uh well, I'm trying, insanity, you know, there's excuses for things. Provocation, hey, they baited me into it like a barroom brawl. He started it, he hit me first. Yeah, I hit him back, but that's an excuse. Here we go, insanity, diminished capacity, mental incompetence. I could not, I could not discern what I was doing because my brain doesn't work the way everybody else's does. So those are all excuses. And finally, procedural defenses. So procedural defenses means you made a mistake in how you got this case in the first place. And the first one of those um, is entrapment. So entrapment means um, I wouldn't have committed the crime, but for those law enforcement officers convincing me to do it. And of course, the most common situation we see here is when they put the undercover agent out for prostitution and she's busting all the johns that stop you know to to enlist her services um, or enlist her for her services um there's a whole section of the book in here i meant to mention before we leave excuses that deal with um the mental incompetence, I am skipping over that. We just don't have time to go into all the insanity defenses. However, I know I had at least one of you who said that you were interested in psychology, you were planning on getting your degree in psychology. It's only a couple pages in the book. If I were you, I'd read over that because I think you're gonna get kind of a basic idea of how the psychology um, plays in with the criminal. You know, it, it's not gonna be on a test. It's not gonna be on the test, um, but I do think it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, a lot of our criminal cases now get referred to psychologists to do testing to see if somebody is able to participate in their defense. You know, can they help their lawyer put on a defense? 
Uh, okay, so entrapment, we just did that one, improper or illegal inducement to crime. Um, double jeopardy. Double jeopardy, if you saw that movie years back, double jeopardy means you cannot be tried for the same offense more than once. So if they brought you up to trial and you were found not guilty, and then they just want to do it again, can't do it again. You get one shot, one bite at the apple, and that's it. Denial of a speedy trial. So the Constitution um, guarantees that you have the right to a speedy trial, which I'll be honest, don't get me started down that road because nothing to me seems to happen very speedily, is that a word? <laughs> very speedy in the criminal justice system. But there is a constitutional provision that gives time limits as to when things have to happen. And unless they are waived, then um, the prosecutors have to stay within those time limits. And if they didn't, then there are repercussions for that. Same thing with prosecutorial misconduct. Prosecutorial meaning the prosecutor, the one who is you know, the district attorney or the attorney general, the one who's trying to prove the case. If they don't disclose all their evidence, if they hide evidence, that's misconduct. They are required by law to turn over everything. So they could be found um, violating that. And if so, it very well could affect whether there is a case at all anymore. And finally, police fraud. If there's police fraud, and of course that's planting, you know, fake evidence or tampering with the evidence or, you know, anything that a police officer might could do to, um, Um, a fit, you know, make it look like somebody committed the crime and they didn't commit the crime. Okay, so that is chapter four. Um, that's everything in chapter four. So I'm just going to remind you that you have a test, has to be done by next Sunday. It's two hours. Make sure you're ready to sit. It should not take you nearly two hours. However, if you are a slow person, if you're one that likes to go back and double check every answer that you're given, then just be sure you have that much time set aside. What I am going to do to kind of help you, kind of a little study guide, um, when we were doing live classes, I would always tell you, tell them, oh, I got a pop quiz for you today. And we would, I'd give them the pop quiz and see if they can, how much they could answer. It's really a study guide. It is not a graded, it's not graded. I don't need it turned in. But it will be a pretty good practice for you. You can do it open book, open notebook, open PowerPoints. It's something that you can use as a study aid. It asks questions that you are very likely going to see again. So it will remind you um, of the material that we've covered in one, two, and four. And again, I'm kind of doing this because I know some of you are very nervous about taking tests again after a lot of years have passed, um, just remembering everything. But with an online class, you've got your book, you've got your uh, notebook. If you keep any kind of notes, you've certainly got the PowerPoints. Everything will be there right there in front of you. So I don't think you're going to have a problem, but I am going to help you this one time. So don't forget, test and turn in the name of your killer. Don't turn in the whole paper on your killer. It's not due yet. Just turn in the name of your killer. So if I were you, the first thing I would do is go over this um, study guide that I'm going to put in an announcement, uh, print it out, sit down and just kind of do it, practice. You know, what we would do in class if we were there is don't cheat first. Go and see how much of it you remember, because the stuff that you remember and get right, you, you're set to go on the test. It's the stuff that you don't have a clue of that you'll want to sit down and then really go and find the answers to that. So message me if you have any problems with anything, but otherwise I'll be back on here, maybe putting some announcements during the week. Those of you, if you don't have access to the book, you're going to send that information to me uh, as soon as you can. And um, I hope you have a great week. I'll have something back up. We'll keep going and go on to chapters five and six next week. So be ready to roll for that.